Okay, guys, are you ready for the next presenter? So this is going to be very interesting, as I hope, because we have a true fanatic gamer on the stage. Uh, Paul has started uh, splash, splash Damage back in 2001, and today he will tell us some of the secrets of how to help a very little gaming company started with a very little capital to grow fast and to leave a big like, track in the gaming industry, to have like eight hits, and then to be able to sell a company for $150 million. Start talking straight away. But I've learned not to do that because there's always a mic problem. <laughs> so let's try again. Hello, everybody. You can do better than that. Hello, everybody. <laughs> uh, my name is Paul Wedgwood. I'm the CEO of Splash Damage. I am responsible for um, working with my development team on multiplayer hits for about 15 years now. We've worked on sequels to Quake, Doom, Wolfenstein, Batman, Gears of War. Um, eight sequential number one hits is something that we're pretty proud of. But over the course of this 15 years, we've also had at least seven near bankruptcies, two technically properly actually bankruptcies, um, where perhaps we <clears throat> were able to keep the bank at bay with some clever communication. Um, but also, um, have come out of this period, I think, with a kind of newfound modesty. We had seven years at the beginning of our studio track record where we were exceptionally arrogant. We grew up under id Software. When we made Wolfenstein Enemy Territory, when we made Enemy Territory Quake Wars, we had 20 million people playing our games at a time when a retail game was a success if it had 5 million people that played it. So we became completely convinced that we were the next big thing, but then we would have some astonishing failure that would typically be as a result of how arrogant we were, how arrogant we'd become. I learned um, pretty quickly that when we made a mistake, it was because we were kind of diverting from the purpose that we'd established for ourselves as a studio. Now, I hadn't read any business books at that time. I didn't know that a purpose was an important thing. And we were just lucky. I think right time, right place is quite commonly the reason why companies succeed. Certainly, a number of my friends that ran studios that went bust, went bust not because of any fault of their own. We'd read the number, the same number of business books, kind of zero, had the same qualifications, zero. Um, so luck played a big part, but now 15 years later, having sold the company, still staying on as CEO for the next four years, I have some lessons that I've learned that hopefully I can share with you guys um, to save you going through the same trouble. I think the other thing for me is that I, I've talked all over the world on all kinds of stages in front of all kinds of audiences, and I'm actually nervous in this one because you might listen to me. <laughs> Um, all of the other ones I do are for high-level execs in the industry, you know, the Microsofts, the Sonys, the Nintendos, and basically they come to the lectures to check in so they can go to the pub afterwards and get wasted with all of their mates. But when I was younger, when I was here with Richard, my co-founder, and we went out to things like QuakeCon in Dallas, in fact, we did 10 uh, QuakeCons, right, Rich, in Dallas, um, we actually paid attention and we wrote everything down that everybody told us, so I'm really nervous about giving you guys misinformation or skipping over something important that on the flight over here, I wrote down all the topics that I wanted to talk about, and I got to 80, 80. And obviously, there isn't enough time for me to talk about 80 things, and I got to think about why is it that today I feel like I know 80 topics that relate to business or game development or culture or values, and I think it's because there were three kind of cornerstones, three pillars that define who I've become, from being that kind of cocky that got expelled from school at 15, to being someone who, amazingly, people respect in the industry. That's because they don't know me very well. So what's bootstrapping? Bootstrapping is what you do if you didn't go to school, you didn't get any qualifications, you didn't go to university, you have no hope of ever standing in front of a venture capitalist or a private equity guy and raising money. You have to raise the money other ways, and in particular, not giving away the equity in your company. And I'm going to talk a lot about why that's so important, why retaining control is so important, and how big an impact this has on an exit if you do ever sell your company a little bit later. But bootstrapping for me is about raising money for the business through actual sales, through selling things to customers, to fans, and collecting that money and using that money to fund organic growth. And I believe that it's the best way to run a company, especially if you don't have an MBA from Harvard 
And I, as far as I'm concerned, when you look at the kind of ultimate trajectory, the amount of freedom and control and financial independence you can achieve, it's far better than if you go the VC route. You see people all the time who build companies that sell for half a billion dollars or a billion dollars, but the owner by that point has one or two or 9% of the company left. In fact, I know somebody who recently sold for $100 million, and he got 1.6 million in the exit after giving up 10 years of his life because he'd been so diluted by everything that he did. When I sold the company, other than the share options that I gave away to staff, I still, sold, I still owned 100% of the business, which means I've got a lot of control about the way the, functions, the company's going to function post-transaction. Uh, so these three pillars that I want to talk about today are the things that I believe today have driven me to become the person that I am. They're kind of like founding uh, values for how I work. And they're the ones that I would take away. When we finish, I'm quite happy to do a Q&A for 10 or 15 minutes here. And you know what? We can go into the hallway, and I'll carry on answering questions. And I'll give my telephone number to anybody. So you're more than welcome to WhatsApp me afterwards, and I'll continue to make recommendations for books and white papers and stuff that I found to be really helpful in the journey. Everything that I've learned has come about as a result of me making a horrific mistake. So every single thing that I've got that I can share with you guys is because I either lost an immense amount of money or frustrated huge amounts of staff. I think our record, Richard and I, is that in 90 days, we want to have 38% of our staff leave, which is quite an achievement, I think, when you think about how bad you can run a company. Um, today, we're a very different studio. Aside from the fact that we've grown to $10 million profit per year, we have 1.5% staff turnover. We have really happy, engaged staff on great training programs. We have fans who absolutely love us in the games that we're making. So I know what it is that, that you could do if you were to study all OT of those topics, but I'm just going to get straight into sharing the three that would define you as an individual if you have that kind of entrepreneurial spirit, if you as an individual want to lead a company to some form of success. I think the first thing, and it's the easiest, is kind of purpose and goal setting. This um, belief that if at first you don't succeed, set the bar slightly higher. <laughs> I think it's a good way to think, and I'm going to get into some techniques that you can use for establishing your own purpose in a way that you genuinely believe, not just something you tell staff about, and then actually using that to guide the decisions that you make in business, in your personal life. And I think that the two things are congruent. I think that if you have values as an individual and they're true values, that they're real, and if you're certainly running a business, there's no distinction between personal and business life. What you do when you work is the same thing as what you do when you play, because after all, you're pursuing your passion. And that's work-life integration. It's not work-life balance. The second subject I'm going to talk about is customer-funded businesses. We're going to get into specifically what it takes to generate money from customers, to keep an eye on the ball, and to make sure that you continue to grow the business without giving up shares. When I sold the company, on the first tranche of cash that we had come through, we had $55 million in cash transfer to our bank account. Now, we know that this doesn't happen when you see those big exits that happen with other businesses. Our goal for that money is now to turn around other businesses and find other companies where we can make staff really happy and create more happiness within the industry as a whole. But that's only possible if you can hold on to the shares. I found um, lots of useful techniques when you're in negotiations, but I would say that my absolute favorite is that when somebody makes you an offer, if it's the lower than you're asking, put the price up. <laughs> um, for complexity and pressure, I think this third pillar is just dealing with the immense complexity of transactions and the pressure that comes from business. A lot of the companies that I've seen fail have not failed because the staff are bad. They've often been talented. They've had great technology. They've had a reasonably good uh, strategy. But the boss of the business has had some kind of midlife crisis. He's become a drunk or a drug addict, or he's gone downhill at the point that the business could have taken off. And I think that self-discipline is critically important. Ten years ago, I went through one of those phases, and I learned enough lessons from it then to realize that it's important to, try to stay straight as you go through this process. And I'm going to talk a little bit about what happened to me and how I overcame it and uh, where I am today and how I learned from that. We're having a lot of uh, uh, mic drop-ins and outs, so I might transfer to a, um, a holding mic if it continues. If we could have a spare just in case. I'd say, though, that when it comes to exiting a business, I've read now 87 business books. You can go to mygoodreads.com. Only eight of them were any good. <laughs> so that's quite a lot of business books that were not worth reading. But the lessons that are listed there are often descriptions of one guy who sold his business, and then they write down everything that he did. And this is tantamount to studying a lottery winner. You know, if a guy wins the lottery, and then you write down everything he does, like he mows his garden in the morning, and he waves goodbye to his 
wife when he goes to work and he kisses his kids when he gets back from school. That isn't why he won the lottery, you know? So you have to be quite careful when you take on board this advice, when you read business books and you think about what's driving success, you have to understand the difference between correlation and cause. You need to be able to, to separate the anecdotes and the stories about people and the steps that they took that they think led to success versus the things that just happened prior to some good fortune and luck. So I'm going to be quite honest with you about the things that I think were luck-based rather than those things which were actually based on pragmatism or intelligence. We're going to get into this first pillar, which is about goal setting. I think it's, like, it's almost like one of those motivational talks you hear in America where someone stops around the stage and they talk about, if you don't set goals you know, for yourself, for your business, then you have no hope of achieving anything. In fact, it's one of the things that the English people don't like about Americans is them stomping around the stage. That's something that the English share with Russians. And our love for our monarchies. Um, <laughs> I didn't have an idyllic childhood, or at least it didn't start, you know, uh, great. I did grow up in a beautiful area. It was um, the West Country in England, which is just beautiful fields and sunny summers and rivers that I used to swim in. And then at about seven or eight years old, I walked into my apartment and my mum's face was completely covered in blood. And I realized that these screams and bangs and shouts and everything that I'd heard were the result of four years of domestic violence by my stepfather. These two huge burly guys kind of stormed into the house. They were from some charity, I think they were called Women's Aid. And they evacuated us from this situation, from this guy who I later discovered. By the way, dove tattoos means you've been in prison. That's what I learned about my stepfather. The, the evacuation that we had kind of stuck us in this big truck, piled us up to London. I arrived in London, a city which absolutely petrified me. I, I hated the big buildings. I hated all the people. I hated all the cars, the widths of the roads. I just disliked every single thing about it. But it set in me a kind of sense of independence that I didn't have when I was in the country. In the country from five years old, I just got let out. I just go and run around. I remember at one point my father finding me seven miles from the house at five years old, you know, just walking along rivers and messing around as a kid. Coming to London kind of set in me this sense that if I didn't set goals for myself, if I didn't have some kind of clear path that I was going to pursue, then I wouldn't be successful. And I wasn't going to be successful based on what society expected of me. I was terrible at school. I got expelled at 15. I'd spent far too much time getting into trouble with the police as a teenager. I was disqualified from driving on the first day that I got my license for 12 months, which I think is frustrating. I had my first bankruptcy at 21. I wasn't really set up well to be a successful entrepreneur. What I did realize, though, is that this kind of sense that if you don't succeed, setting the bar a little bit higher, just challenging yourself higher than you did before, was something that my friends didn't seem to do. The friends that I grew up with have since spent years in prison for drug dealing, for scams, for conning people. And at 17 or 18, I realized that the people that surrounded me were going to have the biggest impact on my kind of outlook in life, my trajectory. So I left them, and I started making friends with middle-class educated kids. And I changed my accent. I used to sound terrible. Like, this is not as terrible as I used to sound. You should have heard me then. And I focused instead on trying to discover what would differentiate me from other people. And I think that a lot of people have great stories about their childhood, about their teenage years, but then they come into business and they suppress them. And they try to be like everybody else. They wear a suit and a tie, and they talk about their university degrees, which is a degree that everybody else that went to university had. Or they talk about the fact that they spent time at McKinsey or Ernst & Young. Or they spent time at an investment bank, and they forget to talk about who they are as an individual. Games companies are exactly the same. If you just do the same thing that everybody else does, if you're just diverse, if you're, you know, year one you're doing Nintendo games, and then you're doing something for the Xbox, and then you're doing multiplayer, and then you're doing single player, and then you're switching around with different genres, you don't get differentiated from the competition. No one can really tell who you are, what you stand for. The product of my childhood is that I enjoyed team play, I enjoyed competition and collaboration, and when Richard, who's here in the audience, and I founded Splash Damage, we founded it on the basis of championing team play. We didn't know it at the time, we didn't write it down, we didn't understand that that was what we were doing, but we turned down so many games in that first 10 years, things like Halo and Perfect Dark, because we knew that we wanted to make multiplayer-based team play games. Now, at the time, people didn't think multiplayer games would sell, so most people looking at us would think we were idiots. But what we discovered is that the internet was going to be successful after all, and that worked out quite well for us. So having a niche, having something that you're really focused on that's different from other people is a fantastic thing to start with. I think this is best um, outlined in a great white paper that I discovered by Michael Porter. I say discovered, it sounds like I invented it. I just found it somewhere. 
this white paper, Can You Say What Your Strategy Is, outlines this basic idea, which is that if you think of a graph with two axes, on the bottom line, you have operational effectiveness. These are all of the best practices that you can steal from other people. How to do HR, IT, finance, how to manage production, how to do your you know, management systems, leadership conferences when you're really big. All of this stuff can just be copied from other people. And it doesn't differentiate you. It might, it might drive down the cost of production. I mean, if you're on Asda or a Lidl or a cheap supermarket, it might be really important to you. But in the video games industry, being cheap doesn't make you different from other people. The other axis is called strategic positioning. Strategic positioning is everything you do that makes you different from other studios, that makes you different from other companies. These are the things that make you memorable. It doesn't matter that, you know, um, our friend Marcus, when he created, what's it called? Minecraft. When he created Minecraft, you know, he wasn't the first block-based sandbox game to come along, but he was the first really, really big one. He was probably the best or the best executed at the time. But if you were to study the way that he exited the business, when Mojang sold for $2.5 billion, when he got $1.6 billion in cash, you would be studying a lottery winner. I mean, there's lots of things that are brilliant about his strategic positioning, how differentiated he was from everything else that was going on in the market. But to study the exit itself, I don't think would bear fruit. This would be true of Oculus or Twitch or any of those other companies that just exit for a billion and it's not really clear how they achieve what they did. But the one thing that we do know is that it's very rare that bland, uninspiring companies that do the same thing as everybody else ever get bought. And if they do get bought, their values are much lower than other businesses. Our business partners, Wargaming, are specialists in amazing military combat. And you can see very clearly that they know exactly what they're good at and they consistently repeat, you know, playing to their strengths and making sure that this is what they focus on. And they don't give up when something isn't amazing or brilliant at launch. They keep refining it and improving it and refining it until they get where they need to be. This is not the scatter strategy of a developer in, you know, Oxford or something in England, which has worked on seven different platforms and seven different... And I don't think those companies have a, have a great future. In fact, the best dev publishers, developer publishers in the world today, you know, Riot, Wargaming, uh, Valve, um, no, not them. Uh, if, if you were to list those top four, what defines them is a focus. Oh, okay, I'll include Blizzard. If, if, you, if, you, incl if you look at the way that they've worked, because Blizzard did have those early games that were all over the place, so it's kind of, a, but anyway, uh, if you include um, Blizzard, they nevertheless have focused very consistently on a style, a tone, a type of experience that is very consistent, that has been refined over the years, that has made them really good. And here's the amazing thing. Blizzard started as a work-for-hire developer getting paid by publishers. Valve started getting paid by Sierra and Origin. They weren't like Riot, where they just went out and raised money and made, you know, one game. That's a good point. Riot should rename it to Riot Game. In any case, if you don't at first succeed, just raise the bar, but stay very focused while you're doing it. I think the second thing, the second pillar that's really important is if you sell all of your shares to somebody else, then you won't get paid for them when you sell the company. It's a very straightforward rule, really. If you don't own it, then you can't sell it, you don't control it, you don't have any power over the negotiation. We were in this position in early 2014 where we had been a customer-funded business for the entire time that we'd been alive. We had just shipped uh, Batman Arkham Origins. It had sold somewhere in the region of six million units. So it had generated a quarter of a billion dollars at retail for our publisher, Warner Brothers. But we weren't really set to make another game for them. And we had a single customer dependency. So even though all of our revenue came from a single customer and we'd been doing pretty well financially, in fact, we were so pleased with ourselves, We'd leased a 2,500 square, meet build, square meter building that was going to be our new HQ, despite the fact that we only had 100 staff. Um, losing you know, work, losing that customer put us in a really, really difficult position. We realized that we needed to have multiple sources of revenue if we were going to be a customer-funded business. It wasn't like sequences of investors where you bring in a VC, different seed funding, or go through different rounds of funding from private equity. You have to have all of the customers at the same time whether it's fans spending money with you or whether it's publishers spending money with you, it's important that you have multiple sources of revenue in a customer-funded business. I think it's also important to have a great culture in the studio because it's not always clear when you're going to have your big breakout success. Today, Dirty Bomb is about to hit 8 million players. It's had 30% revenue growth month on month for the past five or six months. But it's taken us five years to get to that point with Dirty Bomb. 
That's a lot of patience from the development team who are working on that title. So as we're working on these, these projects, we know we have to go and get other customers. We'd also codified the values for the studio, so we understood that we recruited people based on their loyalty, on their friendship, on their trust, on self-reliance, on team play, and we didn't want to compromise those values. But you'll remember at the beginning I said that values, when you hold them dearly, are not just something that you have at work. These are things that you also have in business when you're dealing with customers too. I think I have a reasonably good reputation for business ethics. I've never burnt any bridges, I've never screwed anybody over. But we were literally, you know, we actually, we had a real dilemma, Richard and I, in the hotel room 45 minutes ago about whether I'd even include this story because it's so bad. But I'm going to tell you guys anyway. I mean, it's only you and the internet that will ever know, so it's not such a big deal. But it ends in us ending up in, in what is essentially a brothel in Seoul. Unintentionally, I should point out. We went to Seoul because we needed business really badly, and we needed a customer that was based in Asia. Because if you just have customers that are based in the west coast of the states that are NASDAQ listed or stock market listed, any impact on the stock market, any impact on console platforms is going to have a significant impact on you on a business. So we had to get an Asian customer. And so we flew to Seoul to try and close a deal to license the worldwide rights for something that we were working on. And it was a pretty important deal because at the time, spring 2014, we had the bank telling us that we were insolvent. It was one of these moments when technically we might have been insolvent, but we convinced them that we weren't. So we're out of money, taking out loans to keep ourselves alive, and trying to figure out whether we can bring in more money from another customer. And these are not problems you have if you go to VCs or private equity and they just give you $20 million. We're in Seoul at the time, and we got taken out you know, to be entertained, and we went to a karaoke bar. And I don't drink alcohol, I should point this out before I start, so I'm not even drunk. We sit down at this big table, and they start bringing drinks and everything, and then a line of girls come into the room with numbers on them. And I'm massively offended. It's not like I'm the most progressive man in the world, but I get pretty pissed off when I see exploitation or sexism. And these girls have numbers on them, I'm not quite sure what's going on. And then a Westerner from the other side, a big guy, says no. And I'm like, phew, <laughs> saved. I mean, I tell my wife it happened, but at least nothing bad happened. And then they roll in another line of girls, and I realize that this twatty, ugly, old, greasy man has just sent them away because he didn't like the girls that were there and wanted to pick a different one. And he picks another girl. And I look at Richard, and Richard's just like, you know, this is a really horrible situation to be in. And then they ask me, and I'm like, forget it. Like, why would, just forget it. And then I look at Richard, and Richard's like, fuck off. <laughs> So they pass us, and they're very nice, and we leave about five or ten minutes later, and we think that we're completely screwed, but actually one of the nice things about dealing with Asia is that they tend to respect, respect you asserting your values. When you're placed in a situation that you consider to be compromising, it doesn't matter whether it's compromised because of business ethics, or your personal ethics, or what you believe, or what you consider to be true, just don't compromise. Like, I genuinely believe, at many occasions, we've been in situations where we would have let the company go bust, you know, rather than working with Nintendo. <laughs> I shouldn't have said that. <laughs> so, what did we learn? Two things. They got us back. They decided that we would sign the contract. This, by the way, is the week that North Korea had threatened South Korea with a nuclear attack. And so they hired a tour bus to take us into the demilitarized zone to sign the contract. And we literally got on this tour bus like something out of Vietnam in the 60s with the hanging tassels on the inside. And the most nationalistic tour guide that you can possibly imagine who spent two hours in traffic telling us everything that was bad about North Korea until we got to the other end and they kicked us out. And we were the only people stupid enough to be in the North Korean demilitarized zone with a contract that we wanted to sign for fun. But we did it because we would rather take personal risk than exploit women. And I think that's fine, because we managed to save jobs. We got the deal done. I think, Richard, it was like $6.8 million or something. And as a result, we kind of came back with a contract, able to save the company and make sure that things didn't go bad. There's a, there's a way that we could have avoided this, which is, I guess, having an education. <laughs> we, um, <laughs> we found a white paper by a guy called Churchill on the five stages of small business growth. And if I'd read it back then, I would have realized that it charted exactly the stages that we were going through. We, they studied 115 you know, small to medium-sized companies that were growing, and they discovered that they went through these very predictable phases. And there's four or five incredibly powerful graphs in this white paper. But the most important one is that shows you the stages where failure occurs. And prior to stage four, which I'll explain in a moment, if you fail at that stage, you just go bust. If you fail to control the people that work for you, if you then fail to delegate to the people that work for you, 
if you delegate really effectively and you hire a corporate guy, they create lots of bureaucracy, you will fail. And then the final really scary failure is when you run out of cash because a growing business needs masses and masses of cash, far more money than you think it's ever going to need. And actually, this stage of failure is called growing broke because you're growing so quickly that the profits you're making are being eaten up by the business that you're doing. This was exactly the stage that we got to when we quite arrogantly took on this huge HQ and only had 100 staff to stick in there. We were more concerned about how shiny and illuminated our, our sign was going to be on the front of the building than we were a business that was going to support the infrastructure that we created. So the lesson that I learned from Churchill's white paper, and this is one you should read immediately if you're going to run your own studio, is that there will be highly predictable stages that you'll go through as a business. And lots and lots of people at Harvard and Stanford and London Business School have already figured this stuff out. And it's worth going and taking a look at this stuff and, and, and overcoming some of these problems before they hit you. That white paper has a whole bunch of tasks. You can just create a to-do list and just do the stuff that he says. And you'll never be in the situation that we did. One that they point out is the single key customer dependency. If I'd read that white paper, I would have gone and got two or three customers. I would have made sure that the uh, pre-production concepting you know, production, post-production, and shipping times were out of sync, and I could have managed the workforce better and not put the position in that horrible, the company in that horrible position. Finally, then, for the kind of third pillar, I'm going to talk about complexity and pressure, but on a microphone that works. I got a mask on. I'm not lying. <laughs> Hello, hello. I could sing with this one. Complexity, this third pillar after goal setting and, and using customer money to fund the business, I think is the third oh, most this. important thing. You have to prepare yourself to just study and study and study and study. If you're very good at running companies, you will consistently hire people that are better than you. You'll hire great finance people, great HR people, great production people, but you're going to have to learn about those subjects at least enough to be able to study them to know whether the people you're hiring are actually good at what they do. So you have to, a, an immense task of studying and learning ahead of you. I genuinely think that, that anybody who's really trying to understand a business just one market segment and then everything that's necessary around it to make that company a success could be looking at two to three years if they're, always work, if they're also working of just studying and studying and studying and studying and trying to bank you know, those lessons that other people have read. As I said at the very end, I'll give you a list of the sort of eight books that I recommend, but there may be different ones for you depending on the segment that you're in. For us, you know, we finally got to the point where we signed a term sheet. We'd had four attempted transactions that had failed for us, and we had some pretty important criteria. You know, we didn't want to sell to someone who was a strategic acquirer who would just make us work on one thing forever, like Batman. We didn't want to sell to somebody who just owned a platform that would force us to just make PlayStation games forever. We wanted to try and do a transaction with somebody that really believed in the vision that we had for the studio, because if you watch my talk from DICE in late 2013, I talked about the fact that we put the happiness of staff ahead of everything else that we do. Well, that wouldn't work if we joined a, a company whose back office policy was to exploit staff for money. I gave a talk in November in Barcelona about congruence, about the need for the back office to aspirationally have the same goals for the company that fans do. So when you're reading the forums and you think about what your fans and what your players want from you, and we're at about 50 million players now that have played our games, and I don't mean like mobile games, I mean like actually 50 million players who downloaded them and installed them and played them, those players have a view of where we should be going. And it's really important that we don't have a kind of incongruent view of where we should be going as a business that's incompatible with what the player wants. But the only reason that any of this is important is that when you do sign a term sheet with somebody, that term sheet is going to really set out your future for you. Now, we thought we had a pretty good deal. At the time, as I say, we'd been technically insolvent about a year and a half beforehand. Um, not actually insolvent, I should say, but it was possible to view the company that way, depending on whether you use liquidity ratios or acid tests or whatever the hell it is accountants call them. I only learned to read a balance sheet about four years ago, so kind of light on accounting. What we discovered was that when we signed that SPA, some of the terms that we were going to specify would significantly affect the degree of operational control that we would have post-transaction. And so if we wanted to do a really good job for our customers like Wargaming or like Microsoft, we had to retain complete control. 
So we had to find a customer that wanted to buy us perhaps because we were growing profits, but had no interest in taking us over as a company. And we were lucky because that's what we wanted. We found a company in Hong Kong. They'd bought Digital Extremes. Digital Extremes had generated about a quarter of a billion dollars in revenue from Warframe. We knew the owners, so we got to talking with them, and they told us that these guys checked out. And we decided to enter a transaction with them. And we signed that initial SPA for something like $20 million. Like, it wasn't a great you know, uh, exit. It certainly would have been enough money for most people to retire comfortably, but it wasn't aspirationally the thing that we wanted to achieve for the studio, and it certainly didn't come with a big cash injection into the studio that we could spend on infrastructure and working conditions, a condition upgrade so that we could do an even better job with customers like Wargaming. In this term sheet that we signed, we insisted on them maintaining the culture that we'd established, and we actually documented our culture, our values, and our purpose in that term sheet. We also told them that we wouldn't compromise on management or control of the business, that we wanted to retain legal and operational control of the company, and so they couldn't come in and fire people or hire people. In actual fact, the deal that we ended up with meant that they couldn't even get door keys, which is actually quite a good deal for us. But then it took two, two and a half years for the transaction to complete. It is shocking how complicated transactions can be. It's, 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 Unbelievable. I actually have a, a photo of the final contract that we signed, and the board table is about half of one of these sides of the audience, and it's completely covered in contracts. And every single one of those had to be negotiated to pull off a deal that totaled $160 million. So the depth and complexity of a transaction can be overwhelming, and I think you should prepare for that by always imagining yourself at your next step. So as I was approaching the sale of Splash Damage, I wasn't studying for the sale of Splash Damage, I was studying to run a private equity fund, to imagine myself running and managing multiple businesses and turning around companies that were distressed. When I was thinking about selling Splash Damage, what I was studying in the earlier days was the management systems and professionalizing them so that when they bought the company, the company would run well post-transaction. Because too many people sell companies that just end up going bust two years later. In the end, the transaction completed on the 31st of March. This year, that's 2017. So it took us somewhere in the region of 21 months from signing a term sheet to negotiating an actual contract. And six months before we did the transaction, we discovered that we had to do an IPO level disclosure. And bear in mind, I haven't even got an O level. I don't even have a maths qualification, so how the hell we were ever going to do an IPO disclosure was hard, but we figured it out and we managed to get it done. So here I am, 31st of March, in the lawyer's office, all of the money's arrived, we're as happy as you could be. I bought one of those ostentatious footballer's mansions and a supercar collection, did all of the stupid nouveau riche things that you're supposed to do. But I'd neglected two things during this period, my health. I was 56 pounds heavier than I am now, which in your Russian kilos here, like 30 kilos, like it's a lot, right? I was really, really unfit and unhealthy, and I'd pretty much neglected my family for about two years at the point that this completed. So as an individual, I'm starting, I had this kind of growing sense of arrogance about my own success, about achievement, but the truth is I'd kind of let my home life down and I'd let my physical self down as well. And I think a lot of people that get into that situation are kind of tempted to go off on different paths, I had a wake-up call and Saturday morning at 10 o'clock in the morning, a private detective arrived with a divorce petition. So no matter how much you plan your future, and no matter how much you think you're going to achieve this or this or this, there is a way that something or somebody can interrupt your plans. Now it is true that today we end up in that situation where we're riding around on private jets and looking at other companies that we can help and turn around and stuff, but I really screwed up my life in this journey. I don't believe that the path to trying to exit a business is a path. A lot of people talk about it being like a gold path, and it's the path to riches and everything else. In my experience, it wasn't. It was more like a ditch that you crawl along on your knees, and people are throwing glass into it while you're doing it. What did I learn? I learned that post-transaction self-discipline is really important. I'm still a vegetarian. I still don't drink alcohol. I still don't do drugs. I've seen so many people go downhill post-transaction as a result of that stuff. I'm settled. I have a, a beautiful, amazing new girlfriend. Everything in my life is actually starting to get back on its track. But don't believe that just because someone says to you that if you sell your company for tens of millions or hundred millions, that it's going to have that amazing impact. The thing that motivates me today is exactly the same thing that motivated me pre-transaction, which is the happiness of staff and the happiness of our fans. That hasn't changed at all. Those two things, are, those two values that I had prior to my kind of obsession with 
money and financial independence and freedom of time have not changed at all. And actually, when I found myself becoming stimulated again and engaged again post-transaction, it's because of the happiness of staff or it's because of making fans happy that I found my place. So many of these tips that I've given you are more to do with you as an individual becoming a better person and being ready to lead a great company and eventually pull off a great exit and hopefully continue running it and protecting it and controlling it. They're not necessarily fantastic business tips. Those techniques that you can learn, you can just look them up online. You can Google how to sell a company, how to value a company. You can study people that have sold one business. And as I said, I think it's a bit like studying a lottery winner. But we've sold three companies now. We've got a sense of what works and what doesn't work. For us, Bootstrap was a very effective method. If you find yourself in a position where you feel like an underprivileged kid with no education, perhaps coming out of a tough background and thinking that you don't have what it takes to succeed in the games industry or the movie industry or in television, then just look at us. Because we were a bunch of completely hopeless kids with nothing to back us, no money, no qualifications, nothing at all, and we managed to pull it off. And when we made mistakes, it was because we were stupid, not because of external circumstances. We didn't blame other people. And when we were successful, it was just because we worked hard and we stayed honest. And we considered business ethics and personal ethics to be the most important thing. There's an element of, of progression in life, which I think is critically important. When you think about how successful you're going to be, if you imagine yourself in your 40s or your 50s or your 60s, it's a simple fact that if you're an employee, somebody else will control your life and they'll control how much money you make. And the amount of money that you make is going to affect your independence. If you become a professional, like a doctor or a lawyer or an accountant, you may be able to charge people by the hour. You can work more hours and get paid more money and you might get paid a higher salary. But when you run a business, the belief is that you will therefore, in controlling the shares, make considerably more money, hopefully while you sleep. But there's one really important final fact which I think people don't tell you. You can never resign. And this hits you about two or three years in. You're in charge of this big company, but you have no freedom whatsoever. You can't leave, you can't stop running it, not, certainly not if you care about your staff. So what we discovered is just to go with it, to let go of those anxieties, and ultimately just to do three things. Set a goal for ourselves that's completely aligned with the purpose that we have in life. Be as self-reliant as we can be. Not depend on other people, not depend on external investors, not depend on external loans, not worry about external advisors telling us what to do, but try and learn everything for ourselves. And then finally, I think, when you decide that you're going to do it, just to hell with it, go for it. Who gives a shit? You only get one chance. Thank you very much. I've got, um, I've got about five minutes for questions, I think, before we have to exit the room. And I will take a question on anything, and I will answer completely openly and transparently. At the front. Um, well, first of all, that was a quality talk. Thank you. Um, my question is, um, how did you go from being chased by police to a running company? I mean, the very beginning, like, was it a step-by-step -step process planned throughout or was it perhaps more like uh, a pivotal moment where you said to yourself, all right, that's it, no more running around, I'm starting my company yesterday and we'll see from there. What was it? So I think, not, not discounting the important role that Richard played, because when we got together, it was the two of us and Arn out, you know, throwing ideas off each other. The reason why I personally made that transition, I think, is because I learned to do something in England that we call blagging when I was a kid. And blagging is basically bullshitting until you get the job, then working for long enough that you can stick it on your resume so that when you get fired, you've got a job on your resume that you now actually work in that industry. Um, in my case, I wanted to work as a computer engineer, and I didn't really know much about computer engineers, so I bought a book on upgrading and repairing PCs. I learned the error codes that are at the back of the book. I went for an interview at a company called Sorbus, and luckily they asked me the error codes that I remembered. I still remember IBM keyboard was like 201, memory was 301, hard disk was 1601. I memorized those error codes, they gave me a job, car keys, I didn't get fired for three months, but by then I'd read a lot more and studied and I managed to get a job at another company and now I was a computer engineer. It's the same way I became a television presenter for two years, generally just completely convincing yourself that you can do that job and then turning up as if you're already good enough at it, I think puts you ahead of everybody else. When we got to the kind of end of my 20s, I was a television presenter in the video games industry, I'd worked a lot on networks and servers and I knew a lot about about you know, improving latency and, and you know, um, running video games on the internet. And also I was very competitive. Richard and I played in competing clans. 
Um, I was the current, or were you the current? No, I was the current UK Team Fortress champion, my team was. They won like one year, it's the only story he ever tells. Um, and so those three pillars of video games and networking and servers and being a TV presenter gave me what I needed to start a business and try and be a CEO. So I think it's just waiting for opportunities, but I wouldn't, it, it shouldn't be constrained or defined by somebody else. Like just decide for yourself when you're ready and just do it. There was someone at the back here. Hello. Uh, you mentioned that you documented the values of your company in the contract and culture statements. Can you, can you talk what those are? Oh yeah, sure. So um, when, we, when I say we documented them, we actually just, our staff, I think it's a hideously corporate exercise to write down the values you think your company should have, which is always, in every business that ever does it, like integrity, you know, honesty, customer service, and then stick them in reception and tell staff to like salute them as they walk through the door. This is basically bullshit, right? What we did is we asked all of our top staff what is it that defines you? Why are you different from the other people? How come you work so well as a click, the top 20 or 30% of the company and your performance is so good? And why does that contrast from the other people that work in the business? And the things that they came back with were not great for PR. They were like, well, this company is very nepotistic, arrogant, you know. So we, you know, um, polished them a little bit. We changed arrogance into self-reliance. We changed nepotism into loyalty. And uh, then we went to the rest of the staff and we said, do you agree that loyalty and friendship and trust are important values in the business. And today we have six, um, a kind of undying loyalty to our staff. 17 years, we've never made a single redundancy. Not one in that entire time. We've not once been late with salaries that entire time ever. I've not paid Richard many, many, many times. You know, we've sacrificed whatever. I went five years without taking a salary or dividends or anything at all to make sure that the business was secure financially. But loyalty is really important to us. And friendship is too. We've fired less than 10 people in 17 years. So we consider everyone to be a friend or a family. And when we consider whether someone should be with us or not, we think of it in the same construct as whether someone should be in our family or not. You wouldn't fire your brother or sister if you fell out with them. If their performance went downhill, you wouldn't fire your mum or your dad. And we feel exactly the same way about the people that are at Splash Damage. Also, by the way, almost all underperformance is caused by things that are going on at home or the boss of the person that they're working for. If a person was brilliant and they go downhill, short of actual mental health issues, you can usually find out what the cause was, and if you're supportive, they end up loyal forever. Uh, hi. Uh, excellent, excellent talk. Excellent talk. Um, I have sort of like a question is remark. Um, uh, I, I don't know if you, have, if, if you have seen Simon Sinek's great TED talk. Uh, oh, Simon Sinek's, yes. Yes. The, the, the why the, the order, the why, how, what, and, and, and it seems that you, you genuinely actually, actually ex, 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 execute this the, the Apple way, like, like it's the why is the first, mm -hmm. like, it, it, I'll just tell you quickly this funny story from, from quoting Simon Sinek, that he compared Apple and Dell. Apple, Apple launched, launched, uh, no, we know, the, 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 the MP3 player, and, and the golden, in, the, in the golden era of MP3 players, uh, Dell did also an MP3 player, which was technically better than Apple's, it, and it was cheaper. But it didn't sell. Because, because I got into Simon Sinek, they started, they, they were internet mind, minded, they started to sell it like ex explaining that, that what it is and, 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 and how, it, how it's better. But Apple, Apple market guys started to say that why? Why we are doing it? Because, because we want to make things differently. We want to change the status quo. And then the expert, okay, okay, we happen to make these, these, these gadgets and com computers as well. But, but the why, the computer, compelling story of why is, is, the, is, the, is the magic thing. And, and, and that also tr translates, I believe, my question is actually, that does the, the answering well the why, does that translate easily to values as well. I, I, I think it will, actually. Yeah, I think that we're, we're, we're big fans of Simon Sinek too. Actually, um, we've developed and run a leadership development program at Splash Damage where our top 32 managers spend one day a month um, uh, studying together and working in workshops together based on required reading that we have for them. And Simon Sinek's book, Start With, Lee, Start With Why, and also Leaders Eat Last, are both required reading on the course that we run for the studio. So I absolutely concur with him. Um, it's not original thinking. Uh, it was Aristotle, actually, who came up with the idea originally. Um, 
why is effectively your ethos, you know, your credibility, um, how is your pathos, the thing that you're passionate about and the reason why you do it, or how you do it, and then of course the what you do is just the logos of what you do. That triplet is a great cornerstone for making any argument. It's for convincing anybody of anything. You know, It doesn't matter whether you're a sports coach or whether you're a marketeer trying to sell products on the internet or something, that, that way of selling things is really good. The problem now is that he's convinced so many people that everyone's doing it, and I think there are some people who just think that what you make ultimately is the most important thing. Okay, guys, we, we should stop right here, but if you have any other questions, you can approach Paul after the presentation, and for now, high applause. Thank you.